Okay, so the last step that uh, we want to do together is to uh, add some state behavior to these buttons. Okay, so uh, that every time I click on this button, I uh, the, the the text which the, the language uh, will change. Just a very a very silly example, but just to, sh to show the mechanism. Okay, so uh, the first question is. Uh, what is the state and where should it be stored? Every button should know about its own language in which it's currently uh, uh, being uh, displayed. And every button needs to change its own state. So basically the, the language can be, the current language of a button can be and should be some state information of the single button. Uh, in uh, in React, what we may do is to uh, use a function which is called useState that defines. Okay, so if you write useState, it should automatically write the import statement for you. Uh, that creates a, a new state variable from which uh, you can define. The, ve uh, the value, for example, the language, and a method for changing the language. Uh, we will come to this uh, next week, okay? So trust me for the moment. So I creating a state variable called language, and I define a method for updating this state variable. So state variable cannot cannot be changed by reassigning the values, but only by calling this setter function. And I can also assign a default value for this language. So the default value could be, for example, props dot language, if defined, otherwise could be English. Okay, so what this line is doing is, uh, Inside the button, inside each button, I'm creating a state variable private to that button. This state variable is called language, and it has a method for updating that. And uh, the default value, the initial value of this state variable is uh, this expression that uh, takes from the property language that is coming from the above component from the app, or by default, uh, I will set the English, for example. And so this means that uh, the rest of the component can display the button according to uh, the state instead of having to process uh, or instead of relying on the properties. So the property will only then tell me the initial language and then the button can just adapt to that. So I don't need all of this. I just need to do like here, messages of language. Because language is this state variable. It's initialized properly with the language or with the default value. So in this case, I also simplified it because it's no longer possible to have a language which is not supported, basically. Okay, because of I saw I sort I set this default directly in the processing of the of the property. This is something that the coffee break helped me think about a simpler way to do that. So if I say this, what I see in the application is basically the English one, language English is displayed in English. The second one, the Italian one is displayed in Italian. And the third one is displayed, that, that doesn't have any property. It is displayed in English uh, by default. Hmm? But what we have is, uh, uh, you see that in addition to the properties, language equal to English, we also have a state variable whose value, whose current value is English here. 
and the second one is a state variable whose value is Italian. So we define this state variable by copying the initial value from the um, from the property. Okay. Uh, Marta is asking: the state function just make the state of the component available to the function set lang. Uh, le let me show you. Okay. Um, so the state is language. If I want to modify the value of the state, I just simply I simply call this function set language. When should I call it? Well, maybe when the user clicks on the button, on click. I can uh, very simply um, assign an event handler to any event, but just by adding some additional property uh, on the on the on the component. And uh, all the on-click requires some JavaScript code with the event handler itself. So I could write here a very simple arrow function saying that uh, maybe, uh, OK, I define an, an arrow function here as a callback for the click event. If uh, language equal to Italian, then set language to English, else set language to Italian, for example. So what I did here is two different steps. Once is I, I learned how to associate an event handler to any component just by stating an, an additional attribute and uh, on click on uh, submit on all the all the event handlers are on like attributes attributes whose name start with on and uh, providing in a javascript fragment so inside the braces the code for the event handler maybe the name of a function a reference to a function or we might just define the function ourselves first second uh, we use the, the set function for setting the new value of the variable. You see that the lang variable, I never touch it. I never try to modify that variable. I only use its value as if it were a read-only variable. Let, treat it as a read-only variable, except when you call this set language. Also, keep in mind that the setting, we'll see that in next week, uh, the setting of the variable is asynchronous. So it will happen later. And when the change will happen, the component will be re-rendered. Okay, But it's all a complexity that for the moment we don't see. And so what happens right now if I save this file is that uh, the buttons can change. OK, let's zoom them. If I click on the button, you see the second one, for example, the state is English. If I click on the button, the state, the state changes, becomes uh, Italian, and so on. Every time I click, the state will update here. Uh, so it will not update immediately because you need to, to focus uh, the inspector, but uh, you see the effect. Uh, Antonio set but lang. I don't have any such variable. Set um, okay. Maybe you called it in that way. I call it just simply set uh, language. Is defined here in the use state. Use state returns uh, an array containing the current value of the state, uh, the initial value, <clears throat> and uh, the function, the callback for updating the state itself. So you decide. Uh, the name of the function by convention is the set with the name of the state variable. It's a function, which is a callback. So we are calling calling back a function that is provided by use state. Um, and this is basically the 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 the, the basic logic. Uh, of the dynamic behavior. I assign some event lender, and through these event lenders, we are changing some states 
changing the state implies that the function my button is called again to render a second time this uh, uh, button. This time the message will be changed, of course. The, um, the language property is only used the first time, the first time the function is called, and in the, in the rest of the application, the last uh, state change is used for defining the current variable of this language. Okay. Uh, why use a setter for the state? Because the state variables are owned by the component and are controlled by React. You should never, never modify directly the language. This is wrong. This would be wrong with 3.0 or 4. Because first, we are breaking the link between the variable language and the value it has from the state. So we are redefining the variable. You're not changing it, basically. Okay. So this will be will become at this moment will become a different variable, no longer the state variable. And second, even if it would be possible, React would have no way of knowing when this variable is changed. And so uh, it doesn't have any way of re-rendering the component in the right moment. Okay, so never. The only way of changing the variable is not a normal variable. It's a state variable. It's not a variable that you use for doing some local computation. Remember, we are in a functional pattern, right? Um, we are in a functional pattern. So a function can only compute a result depending on its property, cannot uh, use any extra information. The only extra information is a, a very strictly controlled mechanism called the state. Okay. Um, Andrea had some problems uh, with the recording. I think it's recording right now. If you have any problems, just tell me. Even by default, when we define the, the use state, uh, the second variable will be a method for change. Yes, yes. The first one is a variable to access the current value, and the second variable is uh, the uh, the callback for changing the variable. Mm -hmm. Did we import use state? Yes, here. And usually, when you when you write use state in Visual Studio, it will automatically insert the the import for you. But of course, it needs to be imported because uh, you are calling this function. OK, but we'll come to this uh, uh, later on. It was just to show you the mechanism. This mechanism is easy because we are modifying a state inside the same component where the state is defined. So I'm modifying my own state. We should uh, also learn, but we will take some, some, some classes, some time, uh, also learn to modify the state from uh, another component. OK, but OK, let's. Uh, Let's do one step at a time. This was just an hello word just to show how it worked. Um, Alfredo, we didn't define the set lang function. No, we didn't define the set lang function. Set lang function was returned by use state. So it's a callback that we received as a return value by use state. So it's defined inside the React library. Use state will give us a, a callback that is used to modify in a controlled way the variable, uh, the state variable. So we don't we don't need to define it. We just need to call it, like uh, you know, re, um, uh, like the reject function or uh, in, in promises. Uh, you receive this function, you call it, but you don't define it. Okay. The state variable is private to the component that calls you state. Yes, yes, it's uh, private to this component. If you have many components, each of them has its own copy, its own private copy, and nobody else can see or modify this variable except uh, from within this function. Okay. Okay. Um, let me just, uh, okay change a bit just the aesthetics uh, instead of rendering some button let me import uh, 
just for um, React Bootstrap. so that I like it better. OK. OK, I only change the style by using booster buttons uh, instead of the low level buttons, but nothing changed. OK, you see that my button is now calling the button, which is the bootstrap component and so on. So it's becoming a very simple application. It already became OK. Uh, with a, with a, we have a little very, with a with a, um, a first tree of components that are really nested inside each other. Uh, Salem, can the array of states contain many variables that represent different attributes? Yes, of course you can create as many state variables as you want. Every time you call it use state, uh, you create a new state variable. Okay, um, but for now, say is the state the management of the state is the complex part is not yet for this week so this week or the next lab will not involve state variables yet i just wanted to give you an idea of the mechanism so that we are ready um, when uh, when is the time okay um, and so right now we'll tr we'll try to understand uh, the basic building blocks huh? of what we saw in our Hello World example. So I try to put the main ingredients together. I try to give you a very short explanation for each of them. So you are not happy with my explanations, of course, because I, I left out a lot of, of details that will take all these uh, uh, one by one and try to see in, in detail how they work, okay? But at least we already have the, the picture of how they fit together in a complete application. Okay, so for example, uh, today I'll try to give you some, some information about uh, uh, elements and components, okay? Uh, a lot of information is just a higher level of detail about what we saw in the, in the last hour. So I will skip some slides because it's just information that you can read and trying to uh, point out uh, the, the important concepts that uh, um, will help us understand better. So basically, we saw that React is all inside this call. This call is already done inside the index.js. We don't need to write it, really. Uh, but how it works? It works by um, getting a first parameter, which is the name of an element. An element is an object returned by a create element call that uh, an element of a given type, div, p, or whatever, with some properties and with some children. For creating the element, we prefer to use the JSX syntax, but it's the same. It's an object of type React element. This element may actually is not an element itself, but it's a, an element tree because it contains also some children, is the first argument to the render function. Okay, yeah, so children may include other elements on their turn and they have this recursive data structure, this three like data structure. And these types, uh, like an element may be a, a div, maybe a p, maybe a my button, maybe up. Okay, so the type of component may be a predefined component like the HTML ones or a user defined component defined by me or defined by some library through a function that uh, describes with an element tree how this component will be constructed, how it will be rendered. Okay, so we are basically nesting the creation of element trees uh, by nesting elements inside other components. Uh, and so this element tree is composed of elements and this com these elements on their turned uh, are described uh, by combining components and so on. So everything is a, is a tree that will expand. Um, React elements are very simple objects. So that's why it's easy and faster to, to create them because it's only a, a, a simple object with a type, which is a, a reference to an object, a, a diction, a, an object for the property and the list of children. Okay, so it's not uh, uh, yet a part of the page, but it's a description of how to implement uh, some part of the page. 
and so it's a, it's not an, an intelligent object. It, it, it doesn't have any callable methods. It's just a, a representation of the information. Okay, so it's an uh, an easy data structure for representing that. Uh, here we have some slides about the create element uh, uh, method, but uh, we don't care about those because we are going to use the JSX syntax. So we are never going to create to call the create element call itself. Um, well, the three parameters are just in the type of the node, the properties that can be DOM properties. So I can pass some properties that are already defined into a DOM node or arbitrary values. Like we call the text, we call the language that was just names to create the property. So there's no rule, uh, there's no predefined set of properties. You can make uh, the properties you know. There are some exceptions. Uh, if you want to set the class property, you must write class name to avoid the uh, pre predefined words in, um, in JavaScript. And then the children are, of course, the content of the node. Um, OK. Uh, instead of describing uh, the, the object, it is the object that we, we constructed by a given element. Uh, for us, uh, we all, we always will prefer to use the JSX syntax, which is exactly the same. Okay, uh, we are, we already know that, and so we saw that it's easier. So what happens is that we have a, a, an element that contains uh, the name of a component button. So we go to the definition of button and see how it's composed, which are its children, which are its property, and we ask the button, please, button, expand yourself with this property. I'm giving you these properties, construct yourself and give me the result. And the result is again, uh, uh, for example, an object of type button with a capital B will render itself by using the button with a lowercase b, so it's the DOM element. By convention, the DOM elements start with a lowercase letter and the user defined components start with a uppercase letter. Okay, so with that, we can separate the two. And, um, in the case, some of the, of the children are uh, again uh, user defined components. React will ask also to those to render themselves and so on recursively. So if a component renders in terms of uh, primitive nodes, of DOM nodes, the process is finished. If a component renders in terms of other components, then those other components will have to render themselves until only DOM nodes are present in the result. At this point, we uh, start the synchronization. Um, DOM elements are lowercase, React components are uppercase, and you can mix the two however you want. Okay. Just remember that we are not dealing with real, real, real DOM nodes, but with a, a virtual representation of those nodes. So there are simple objects uh, and not the real DOM nodes. They are, we still are, we always work with the virtual DOM and not with the real DOM, okay? Okay, well, as, like we said, uh, we don't want to create, uh, to write, say, these objects by hand or uh, write, um, use the create um, element. We use simply the JSX extension, which is just really a syntactic shortcut. So whenever I have a JSX expression, the Babel translator will translate that in the, the corresponding create element call. So what JavaScript really sees is this. What the browser really receives and, and um, interpreters is this code here, okay? But for us, it's easier to write it in, in this way. Uh, a set of uh, parameters that are the proper, that are used as, as properties for uh, custom components or um, attributes for DOM nodes and a set of children that are just nest, nested there. Uh, the only problem, the, the, the difference with, the, with respect to HTML is that a tag may, may have a closing, or if you don't have a closing tag, you must have a defined slash to say that we, you don't have the closing tag. For example, here in our app, we have this syntax here saying, okay, but my button is this the only opening and closing tag together. It's not allowed to have something like that. So you either close it explicitly, my button, 
or you 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 write the the, the shortcut for closing it immediately without having the, the double tag. So this is mandatory, otherwise it's a syntax error. Uh, JSX doesn't know the auto closing of tags like HTML does. Hmm. Uh, this syntax may be used everywhere, not just in the render function. So you can store elements uh, in variables, you can store them into arrays, into objects, uh, whatever. At the end, you are just calling a function that constructs an object. Hmm. So you can you can do whatever you want with those. Uh, you, we will use a lot of mapping uh, functional uh, statement for for manipulating this uh, in the in the future. Okay. Um, okay, this is nothing important here. Uh, we can also have a computed tag name, but really we don't uh, we don't want to go into these details for dynamic creation of components. Uh, um, it's not very useful. Um, in JSX, uh, you can list attributes, and these attributes uh, are written with a normal syntax. When the value of an attribute is uh, a string, you just provide a string. In all the other cases, when the value of an attribute is a number, or is a Boolean, or is an object, or is another expression, you must enclose the attribute value into the braces so that it will be evaluated by JavaScript. And so we returned as, a, uh, as an object. Otherwise, uh, it will be a string. Okay, so uh, it's an error to write uh, something like uh, you know, size equal to two, for example. Hmm? This is a syntax error. So either provide a string or provide an expression. Just a syntax. And this expression is, is better because you then uh, have the, um, the proper type of the object computed by JavaScript. So you, can, you are actually passing an object, not a string. It's better to pass an object so that the props uh, variable in the, in the component may actually extract values from the object and treat it like a, like, like a real object. Uh, of course, uh, it can be an expression, and this expression is computed at uh, dynamically, okay, at runtime. Uh, anything inside the, the, the tags is a list of children that will be rendered. Uh, these children may be strings, normal text, for example, like we had here. We have uh, text, a normal string, as the content of the children of the button element. It may be ad other JSX elements, so we are nesting components. We may have an, any expression that will return a string or an element. Or interesting, we may have a, an expression returning an array of elements. So especially if we want to nest not, three, not only two buttons, but three buttons or four of 10 buttons, we could also create an array in JavaScript and return that array in place here. An array of JSX components. And that will be uh, automatically expanded into the different components put one, one side by side, okay? We will use this a lot uh, when we're creating dynamically some list of items, uh, some tables and so on, when we have all the data into an array of array of data and we translate that into an array of, uh, uh, of components. Um, for example, here we could have something like, uh, let me open a second column. Okay. Let me see if, and inside the second column, I may have uh, an array. Imagine we have uh, English and Italian. It's an array of languages, and I want to render as many buttons as, uh, uh, as the language I have. So uh, many, many buttons, each with a, a specific language. Okay, I can use, for example, a map, this is an array. I can use a map that will map 
uh, the language L language into a button with language with the attribute language equal to sorry to LG slash so this is something that we are um, so what I'm doing here is just a map or operation that will map an array of strings into an array of objects of JSX objects of components and of course these components are uh, are customized with the value of this parameter okay if it works uh, where's the browser okay you see that we have a second set of buttons here on the right on the second column that uh, have been initialized with different uh, properties uh, in uh, language english and language italian thanks to this uh, dynamic generation so i didn't return i didn't make a loop for creating and adding many elements i just returned an array where i, I mapped uh, the, the values of the variable into the properties of the object hmm? um, for for the question can we have another container in this return statement that giuseppe is asking uh, the, uh, we'll, uh, we'll see in a moment uh, the return should only return one top level component. So if you have, if you have two containers, you, you should wrap them into a, a div that will pull them all together. Um, Lorenzo is asking about these braces uh, because what we said, the attribute should be a string or a JavaScript object or a JavaScript expression. Okay, so here we are inside a JavaScript expression, okay? But uh, from this symbol here to there, we are inside the JSX syntax. So it's not JavaScript anymore. So we have a JavaScript function that, cont that contains a JSX expression that we contain a JavaScript expression that contains a JSX expression that contains a JavaScript expression. It's perfectly normal. It drives you crazy, <laughs> probably. But uh, always remember, if you are inside braces, it's JavaScript. If you are inside uh, uh, Angular brackets, uh, it's, it's JSX. And so you can open brackets or open uh, braces depending on where you want to uh, or switch the language. Uh, Salem does the second column contains also the event listener. Uh, the event listener is part, yes, is part of the my button component. So each button has its own event listener because we are creating the, the app doesn't care about that because it's something which is private to the component. The component knows how to manage its own state. Okay, it's something that we declare there and we don't see how it works from the outside. So that's why JSX is powerful because we can nest things, uh, make uh, something very complex. Okay, this is another example, but we, we already made them, made one more complex. Uh, the trick is that if I have an undefined or a Boolean, we both true and false don't render anything. Okay, so in this case, you can uh, just uh, um, suppress some part of the page by returning undefined or by returning it's not an error inserting undefined into JSX it just doesn't show anything okay and so you don't need to return an empty string or something like that you return a, a true or false if this is true it returns true and renders nothing if it's not true nor false then you can uh, return another part of the menu or something like that Okay, uh, we can add all the attributes. Uh, there are, there's a slightly different syntax in JSX from, uh, from HTML. Um, for example, in JSX, uh, uh, okay, we always need to have the quotes or to have the braces. 
uh, in some cases there were some shorter notation HTML which are not supported in JSX. Actually, in the latest version of JSX, also this is allowed. So um, there are no comments in JSX. If you want to write a comment, write that inside a JavaScript environment, like that, if you want, or just write those outside the JSX expression, so in the rest of the function. Uh, you can also pass some attribute names, so not only properties defined by your component, but also properties already defined in the DOM nodes. Uh, just uh, convert them. Uh, JSX is always using the camel case uh, component. So, for example, on click in HTML is usually all lower case. In JSX, uh, you must have a capital C for on click, for on change, and so on. So, all the attributes which are composed by different words. Uh, need to be capitalized in this way, like the JavaScript standard. And uh, in particular, there's a style attribute that uh, doesn't receive style. You remember it's for setting styles on a single component and you receive it receives a, a set of CSS properties. Instead of a string here, we need to pass an object, which is better by the way, okay? And also the CSS properties are a bit mangled. So margin dash top, which is a real CSS property, should be written in camel case like margin top, but it's just syntax or so details. Uh, but everything you already know about DOM can be translated uh, in JSX. Um, can Carlo is asking if we can pass the event inside the callback? Uh, yes, yes, of course, of course. Uh, um, you want to process the event, uh, for example, here. I, I didn't, I didn't need. Uh, Okay, information about the event, but of course I can pass the event here, receive an actual event and, and use this information inside the callback. Yes. Uh, it's a different event, it's not a DOM event, it's a, it's a synthetic event by React, so it has a slightly different properties, but the mechanism is the same, yes. Um, there are also a, a very convenient syntax. Okay, it's not a new syntax. We already know the syntax, the spread syntax for objects, eh? okay, or for arrays that will uh, de um, take the, each component of the object or the array and transform them into a, into a list, basically. So if you want to, if you're a component and you need to pass many properties to this component, you should write property one equal the value of property one, property two, value of property two and so on. But what happens if you already have an object that contains the exact same properties you want to pass to the component? Uh, it would be ugly to say, okay, message equal to welcome dot message, recipient equal to welcome dot recipient. So the name here and there is the same. Uh, okay, this can be shortcutted by using the spread syntax. So you, if you're spreading an object, you are actually translating them into a, the list of message equal the value of the first, uh, recipient equal the value of the second, and so on. So it's a quick way if you want, if you have an object and you want to pass it down to the other to its children, you just have this. And by the way, this object, uh, in many cases, you already have it, and it's called props. This is already an object that contains some properties. If I wanted, if I needed to uh, pass all these properties to my children, I would just uh, uh, like do like this. And so I will, I will be adding to the button call many uh, new properties, many new, new parameters corresponding to all the properties that I already received. If I want to pass through everything, and maybe adding something, okay? So these are very convenient uh, syntax. It's, it's not new, but in this context, it's, it finds it convenient. And you can also um, extract uh, some, some properties and only pass the other ones uh, by playing with the spread operator, okay? So you will find uh, maybe examples uh, uh, that use this syntax very liberally. Say, okay, I have many properties, Kind is a property that is interesting for me, so I will extract it, and all the others will be passed to my children, for example. 
So uh, I'm mentioning this uh, not because you need to do need to use those because maybe you don't want uh, you can write more explicit code even if it takes a more a few more lines, uh, but because maybe we see examples around and try to understand uh, what people are writing uh, in React because uh, um, there are quite of strange writing patterns that are that that, that became uh, common. Okay, oh, that property I think I skipped that. Um, so you see, there's nothing really new compared to the example. There are more details that are useful to refer them to them later. Um, for creating components, we already saw the basic mechanism is uh, uh, defining a function with any any function syntax you like that takes some properties and returns uh, uh, some elements. Uh, there's a return statement missing here. Right? It should be a return something. I'm oh, no, sorry, I used the, the square barrels. Okay, so it's an implicit return. So this is the easiest way of creating, a, uh, defining a new component. They take properties of the input, they return the elements as they are put. Uh, they must return a tree, so not many trees, but only one tree. And the element that returned should only depend, it should be a functional value of the properties. So same properties, same result. Hmm? Uh, and no, with no tricks uh, and no side effects uh, and something like that. Because you don't know when React will call that function. So maybe it will call it once, maybe it will call it three times or five times, so you don't know why. So you cannot rely on knowing when the function is being called. You know that the function is called whenever it's needed. And that's all you need to know. If you want to do something more, where the, the function has more state information, more knowledge about what it's doing, more um, control about uh, the life cycle of the DOM object it creates, uh, we must use the hooks mechanism uh, that, uh, for example, we just uh, show the, the state hook, uh, which is the simplest one. Uh, there are other hooks that maybe give you more control over the function and over the state, okay? In a very controlled way. But for the rest, it's just a very pure, purely functional uh, method. Okay, uh, we are in this slide, but we won't, we won't uh, go into detail. We have the, the, the algorithm for uh, how uh, React is working, okay? What we already saw, uh, it calls a render, and if the render contains a component, it calls the render for the component and so on until all the component have been rendered recursively. And at the end, you compare the result with the existing element tree in the virtual DOM and then propagate the difference to the real DOM. This is React in, in, in the real library in six steps, basically, the core of the library. It's normal to create many small components and it's normal to compose them, to nest them, or even at deep layers. If a component becomes too complex, uh, try to separate it in smaller, in smaller parts uh, as independent components. So it's a uh, uh, it's, it's normal way of, of working to, uh, to create many small components because they are more, user, more reusable and easier to test and, and to configure. Um, we mentioned before that we could return um, a list, uh, an array, okay, when you are creating a JSX array. Um, there's a, a detail which is very important. Whenever you're returning an array, remember that uh, uh, React needs here to check the differences between the previous and the next virtual DOM to be able to propagate to the real DOM only the minimum set of differences for performance reasons. Okay, imagine you have a long list of names, a table rows of list items, for example, and you modify only the fifth one, but you have a hundred of names. You modify one of them. So uh, in the virtual DOM, React will see that first you had uh, a hundred lines, a hundred elements in an array, and then you only have 99 of them. But can how can React know which one has been deleted? Are, are these 99 a subset of the previous ones, or are these 99 uh, completely different from the 100 that we had before? 
and if it's if they are subset who has been deleted so mm, this comparison would be expensive to do and so uh, react will ask for your help for our help um, by uh, forcing us to add some key attributes whenever we return a list okay whenever we return a list of numbers we must add the key attribute in addition to the other attribute that we want to pass with the addition to this uh, to the other um, to the other um, properties that you want to pass and this attribute should be a unique identifier for for the row Okay, so that when you re-render, when you modify the list, it will just need to compare the keys and not, uh, uh, it doesn't need to compare the contents of the components. So this uh, is a rule, always when you have a list of items, when you are, especially when you're generating a list uh, with, from my, by mapping an array like we did before here, we should add not just a language attribute, but also a key attribute. For example, the key is the language itself. Something that is guaranteed to be unique and different in the different buttons of the same list. Okay. Uh, otherwise, probably you should already have a warning Okay, before I didn't save this file yet. Okay, before in the console, I had a warning each child in the list should have a unique key property. This is what we are talking about. We have a list here of two buttons, and these two buttons are identical from the point of view of React. So it doesn't know how to modify them. If I add a key attribute to the list, so remember it happens when we are returning an array, it only applies there. And so we can have the same result, but we, we shouldn't have the, the warning anymore here in the console about these two buttons, okay? So it's a matter of being efficient, helping React in doing an efficient updating of the DOM to recognize which component didn't change because they still have the same key and which components were added or deleted or modified. Okay, so usually when you're doing a map to create a set of elements, always remember all oh, the keys. Okay, uh, remember to add the keys. The keys will not pass to the children. It's just something that React uses internally. If you have an ID, is the, the best candidate for, um, for being uh, used as a key. The, unique, the unicity, the uniqueness of the keys is only required within the list, not globally on the page. So you don't, it's not something complex only for that list uh, remember always to add the keys and also remember always to have a look at the console because many errors are just written in the console of the of the application so try always when you're developing always have a console open so that you can get a, there's a, a lot of messages and warning that react is giving you and they are always uh, good suggestions uh, we had a question before about uh, can we add the two component, uh, two sorry containers in the same return? Uh, and there was, a, I said that there was a, there's a restriction that a function should re always return one tree with a single root. So if you want to return a list of elements or many elements, uh, you cannot do that. Okay, you cannot uh, have uh, here. Uh, like here, yeah, after a container, another container, for example. Um, okay, everything is wrong because uh, only one element, uh, one top level node is, uh, is allowed. But so if you want to do that, if you need to do that, you could have add an extra node like a div at the beginning. But uh, having extra div is also not very convenient. So there's a shortcut of a very strange type of node, which is the sort of an empty node. It's called fragment, React fragment. So you can wrap your code into a opening and closing empty tag. And that will be a sort of an invisible div that will disappear in the DOM. So it will not be mapped into a real node in the DOM, but it's just for putting together, for keeping together the list of elements. 
So if you have to return a list of elements, you, you should drop them into one container and this fragment could be a good way of having a container without uh, adding a new, new new real node to the to your tree. Okay, so these are the main uh, say rules or the main uh, criteria for for defining these components. Uh, defining components is easy, but relatively easy. Uh, from the syntax point of view, we just have to learn to be careful about the rules about the JSX, and especially the keys and the lists are very powerful, but we should be aware. And of course, we should uh, design a component with a clear view of what are the properties that that component receives and how what it does with its properties, even before going to the state. Okay, so a good part of the design of an of um, architecture of the architecture of, of your application is deciding which components you need and deciding which properties each component uh, also needs. Okay. Okay, so uh, in the next weeks, we will add some complexity, basically the state. So first, for the moment, we are just working, uh, say forget about the use state call and the callbacks uh, that we defined. Initially, we'll try to be familiar with creating components, with managing properties, with propagating properties, creating lists, and so on. And this is what we are going to do in the lab, basically. Um, and uh, um, and then from next week, we'll add the complexity of the state management. So how to use hooks. We saw an example, but it's really more complex than this. And so we also learn how to manage this bidirectional flow of data from top to bottom and of action from bottom to top that I mentioned before. But for the moment, we didn't see it in our example yet. Okay, uh, let me, if you don't have any questions about this, uh, let me uh, say you a few words about uh, the lab. Okay, so as you know, we are, let me write, open notepad so that I can write something. So we have the big lab one starts on Monday. Monday, what's that? 12 or, yeah, 12. Okay, and uh, duration of four weeks. So it's a one lab that uh, will uh, um, keep you working on a single project for four weeks. Okay, uh, the your submission at the end of the four week only. So you don't have to submit anything in between. You can work on yourself, you can ask for help, you can show your code, whatever, but the real first submission is only at the end. Um, you, we must work on a platform which is called GitHub Classroom. Okay, this GitHub Classroom uh, provides you, basically the, the, allows you to specify the composition of the group and it provides you with a, uh, with a repository. So it gives you a private repository for the group. And you have to develop your project inside this repository. So that when you finally, you can commit, you can push, you can work, with, this is your repository. At the end of the fourth week, uh, you use this repository to, to submit uh, your code. Okay, so do all the development in there. It's a private repo, you can, only you can see those, uh, uh, what you're doing there. We are going to publish, okay, uh, three documents oh, on the, uh, or more. One is the instructions for GitHub Classroom. Okay, how to register your group, how to create your repository. There will be a document, a step-by-step -step document, how to use that, okay? You just have to, um, you just uh, need to have a, um, a GitHub username, of course. Okay, and then you will be matched to the, the your matricula ID uh, in the student list. There's a second document which is the general uh, Big Lab One assignment. 
So it gives you the general picture of what needs to be done. You, can, you already can guess which will be a variation, an implementation of the to-do list with the, with the different rules, okay? Uh, with the rules for submission, for development and submission. And then we will have four different documents, parts, uh, let's say the assignments for each week. It will be called 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, no, the different parts. So every week we will give you more details about the assignment for that week. So at the beginning, we already have the the general assignment, you already know where to go, but uh, we are splitting the work in four different steps uh, so that it's easy for you to focus each, each week on a different part. So, for example, in the, in the first week, we'll tell you, don't do, don't try to do anything dynamic, it's just to familiarize you with React. In the second week, we'll add properties. In the third week, we'll add state and so on. Okay. And so, in parallel, we are going forward with the, with the, with the classes and you will be going forward with your project. Um, so uh, tomorrow, by, uh, tomorrow we'll have the instructions, the general assignment, and the first assignment for, for this Monday. Uh, the work is in, in groups. OK, so uh, one assignment is to one group. And uh, uh, it can give you uh, 0, 0, 0.5, or one point to each all members of the group. Okay, so at the end you can have up to one point, one point per person. Uh, the, we will evaluate the, the the assignment and give you if, if it's complete one point, if it's partial, half a point uh, to all the members of the group, and this point will add to the exam scores at the end. Okay, so the exam score will be the sum of three different. Uh, the, the project evaluation, the oral discussion, and the big labs. Um, one, yes, well, the assignment is yes, the big lab. Yeah, not, not it's one point in total for the fourth week. Hmm? One submission. Uh, can the lab be done individually? Uh, Oh, you, of course, you can do that. It's free, so it's normal. Uh, you can work in the lab as you want, but uh, uh, we would prefer that you work in groups of three or four because it would be impossible for us to evaluate uh, so many individual projects. Okay, for, so for the evaluation, for the submission, for the scoring, you need to work in groups so that we can, you know, just check. Uh, maybe 40 different projects instead of 300. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be two big labs, Gabriele. One is the these four weeks, uh, and the second one is the in the, the last four weeks. We still have uh, eight or nine weeks to go with the course, probably only eight, so it's four for the big leg one, and the second four for big leg two. So you, at the end, you may have up to two points for the labs. Uh, Andrea, if uh, if you want to do that, there are still uh, several groups that only have three people in them, so you could join one of the groups. Hmm. Okay. Uh, we I don't want to make it too much complicated. Just one point. So I don't want to make it complicated. Okay, but uh, we were in four. Only three worked well, and the other one didn't work too much. It's just one point. It's just uh, something to help you, motivate you in working together in the labs, uh, like uh, we already are doing uh, in the in the rooms, uh, in the labs, and so on. So that. Uh, and also try to, to finish it. Okay. The only um, the other detail is that the solution, the proposed solution. will be given only at the end. So the, the solution for the first part of this week will only be published after the whole uh, big lab has been completed because otherwise you will copy, you may copy our solutions. So this could be a problem, a partial problem if uh, 
if you don't you 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 will not have your the solution week by week uh, but only after the, the the four weeks uh, and we will give you the solution for the four different steps uh, separately but we have to wait until uh, uh, the middle of may but the exact date and time is retained this function on the, the assignment sorry okay so uh, uh, wait for the documents to appear on the website and uh, on GitHub. We will write a notification in, uh, in Slack, of course, so that you can uh, uh, go directly to, doc to document. And you may start working whenever you want, especially during the labs on Monday. Uh, yeah, the lab will still work, OK? So on the Monday, uh, especially uh, because we, we will be working with your project. So nothing changes, okay? Every Monday, you still have the three terms of the lab with the assistant, with the, with the students. You can ask questions on Slack as before. In addition, if, if you submit, you may get one point. That's it. Are we allowed to come to a point for the lab on Monday? It's possible to book it. Uh, I don't know anything about that. Uh, we didn't get any 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 new any news about uh, coming to the Polytechnic. So let me ask. Uh, for the moment, no. Okay, not this Monday. Uh, no, I uh, I don't I don't think. Uh, I, probably it's a mistake that we, you can book it because uh, we didn't have any any news. Or maybe somebody from the you know, the high high offices are changing something that would not be a bad idea, honestly. But uh, we'll let you know. For the moment, we don't. I don't have any news about coming back for the labs. So. Okay. So I see there are still a couple of questions pending, probably. Giuseppe is typing really slow. The individual project we start at the end of Big Lab 2. Uh, the, OK, you are probably uh, referring to the exam. OK, uh, the exam project that will be individual, of course, will start 20 days before the exam date. OK, we still don't have the dates for the exams in June or July, but uh, you know that 20 days before uh, we will publish uh, the, the, the assignment for the exam. Uh, it's very likely that the assignment uh, will come, also these 20 days will come before the end of the course. And of course, in, if, it, if this happens, it's very likely that it will happen. Uh, the last week of the course will be devoted for uh, assisting you in, in the exam, of course. Okay, so we won't have uh, any extra material. When, when the exam uh, is published, uh, we will focus on doing that and, uh, and helping you with that. We give you feedback. But uh, I cannot be more precise because I don't have the, the dates for the exam. But you always remember the rule 20 days before we publish the assignment. There's a, a slight risk that we may overlap with the Big Lab 2, but then it's not up to decide the dates. Okay, so I would thank you for today and uh, see you on the labs and see you on Slack in the next days. Bye-bye, okay. have a nice day.